The original ukulele is a fun throwback to mid-90s free-roaming platform games a la Banjo-Kazooie. It stays true to its retro roots almost to a fault, but it was a pretty fun time. Rather than continue in this direction for their next game, however, developer Playtonic Games took a left turn and instead opted to build a spiritual successor to Donkey Kong Country. Which kind of makes sense when you think about it. After all, the studio's pedigree includes many fine folks who previously worked at Rare on the Donkey Kong Country series itself. After finishing the third game in that series, however, and making the leap into the third dimension, Rare never really went back to expand upon the original Donkey Kong Country design. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, then, is precisely what I had hoped for, a spiritual successor to DKC that stands strong next to both the original games and Retro Studios' own take on the formula. What makes this project especially interesting from the DF perspective, however, lies in its performance target across every platform. Unlike the original ukulele, Playtonic has opted to target 60 frames per second across every single platform, a tall order, especially on Switch. So how does it fare? What can you expect on each platform? And how does the game itself stack up to the classics? Let's dive in and find out. With bright colors and richly detailed stages, Ukulele in the Impossible Lair makes a great first impression and is a beautiful looking side scroller. It's built using 3D graphics but plays out entirely in 2D, much like Retro Studios' aforementioned Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Like the original Ukulele, Impossible Lair is built in Unity, and it quickly demonstrates both improvements to the engine itself and an evolution of the team. This new game is both more visually striking than the original, and yet so much more fluid. Obviously part of this stems from the design itself. The game is now played from a side view as opposed to a free roaming environment, and this allows for clever visual tricks such as 2D elements used in the distant background alongside 3D structures. It's an example of gameplay first, with clean, legible level design, smooth performance, and great contrast between the back and foreground. It's great stuff. This time around, then, the game is available across all major platforms on day one, including Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and the PC. Unlike the original Ukulele, however, every single version of the Impossible Lair was developed in-house at Playtonic Games, whereas Team 17 handled the PS4 and Xbox One conversions of the previous title. So what kind of differences can you expect from each console version then? Let's start with a little resolution talk. And for starters, there's the Switch version, which served as a major focal point throughout development. When played in docked mode, the game delivers a fixed resolution of 1360 by 765, while portable mode instead runs at 960 by 540, which is where I feel it looks best due to the smaller screen when in portable mode. Then we have Xbox One X. I sampled this version at Gamescom earlier this year, but the final game utilizes a dynamic resolution system. It targets native 4K and reaches that resolution most of the time, with dips occurring only when frame time exceeds 16 milliseconds. The lowest I counted then was 1584p, which occurs when loading certain stages, such as stage 4. After a few seconds, however, the resolution stabilizes, increasing to around 2016p in this area, before eventually reaching full 4K after moving forward. Curiously, dynamic resolution is only utilized on Xbox One X. All other versions use a fixed resolution instead, which means on Xbox One S, PlayStation 4, and even PS4 Pro, the game runs at a locked 1080p, which doesn't seem right at all, honestly. You would expect a higher resolution on the Pro compared to the base consoles. So what's going on here? Well, I reached out to the Playtonic team, and their official response on the matter is... We do plan to look at it again, but unfortunately, we don't yet know if there is anything we can do. But aside from the lower than expected PS4 Pro resolution, the split is somewhat expected. Thankfully, even when playing at lower resolutions, the game still manages to look great. But are there any other differences between the various versions? Well, there's two main differences that I noticed specifically in regards to the Switch version versus the other versions. 
Firstly, texture resolution appears to have been reduced, as is texture filtering itself. As a result, surfaces appear somewhat less sharp than on the other consoles, especially when viewed at oblique angles. Notice how the texture here appears much blurrier than it does on the other platforms. That said, this issue is most noticeable when playing in docked mode on a larger screen. When played in handheld mode, the loss in detail is more difficult to spot, and this is true of both the regular Switch and the Switch Lite. The other difference I noted lies in the shadow resolution, which is slightly reduced, resulting in chunkier edges on dynamic shadows. These are the two main differences that I noticed. As for the other versions, the assets appear identical, with the most noticeable difference stemming from improved texture filtering on Xbox One X, which is really likely just a byproduct of the difference in resolution. So looking across all versions, the results are almost universally excellent, with the base consoles offering full 1080p 60 playback, Switch stacking up about as well as you'd expect, and Xbox One X running with a higher resolution, it's really only the PS4 Pro version that falls short here, which is certainly a disappointment as the hardware is more than capable of pushing beyond 1080p. Perhaps it can be improved in the future. No matter which platform you choose to play on, however, the visuals, I think at least, are rather beautiful. Each stage is packed with dynamic shadow casting lights and beautifully handcrafted scenery. Textures are sharp and clean. Underwater areas are suitably murky. And we even have a great looking overworld to explore, which completely switches things up. I'm a big fan of the presentation overall, that's for sure. And another feature that I really enjoyed are the tonics. These can be discovered and equipped, resulting in fun modifications to both gameplay and visuals. Some of my favorites thus far include the Game Boy derived color palette option, which reduces the game to a greenish hue reminiscent of Nintendo's portable system and the 4x3 mode, which changes the game's aspect ratio, resulting in pillar boxing on the left and right side of the screen. The best though is surely the GB resolution tonic. Why? Well, beyond the obvious low resolution itself, the tonic costs 144 quills, with that number, 144, referencing the vertical resolution of the Game Boy screen, which just happens to be 160 by 144 Cute. But obviously, as a 2D platform game, performance is key, and this is where the game really shines. Basically, the team aims to deliver 60 frames per second across the board, no matter which platform you're playing on. A nice leap from the 30 FPS ukulele. So how does it fare? I'd imagine the Switch version was perhaps most challenging in this regard, but as I understand it, this was also the target platform for the game. The idea there, I'd imagine, is that if you can hit 60 frames per second on Switch, it should be easier to achieve the same results on other platforms. And as you can see, the team was very successful in reaching this target. Throughout the overwhelming majority of the game, the impossible layer delivers the promised smooth, stable 60 frames per second frame rate, free of hiccups, skips, hitches, and the like. Based on the results in many other Unity titles on Switch, I find this especially impressive. Yes, Retro Studios achieved a stable frame rate with their first two DKC titles, but those were built for one platform using a proprietary engine. As a fully multi-platform game created in Unity by a rather small team, hitting 60 frames per second is worthy of praise. That said, it isn't 100% perfect, maybe just 99. You see, in a couple spots, such as this, I did manage to produce slowdown, specifically in this stage. You'll notice as I move along here that there is a slight dip to fluidity. It's the same in this specific spot here near the end of another level where, for whatever reason, the frame rate just starts to dive even though there's really not much happening on screen. Again, this is an outlier and most of the performance is very, very smooth. While I've yet to finish the game, this is basically the worst case that I've found yet and the results are solid overall. Then there's portable mode which fares even better. The same stage, which exhibits slowdown while docked, runs perfectly smoothly in portable mode, and I was not able to trigger any slowdown at all during gameplay. Again, it's always possible, that's just the nature of things, but from what I've played, it's locked at 60 in portable mode. 
There is one minor downside to mention, however. When using the visual tonics, such as the aforementioned GB palette option, the frame rate is cut in half to just 30 frames per second. These are just a fun bonus feature, of course, but I found this cut in performance rather curious. So what about the rest? Well, this is one of those cases where the results are somewhat boring in terms of frame rate analysis, but ultimately much better for the end user. I played up through the first five or six stages on each of these systems and put to the test the same level that was giving the Switch some problems. And as you're seeing here, the second slowest console in the bunch, the Xbox One S, has no problems zipping along at 60 frames per second. There isn't a single hiccup in this stage, or any other stage for that matter, that I discovered during my playthrough. Again, the qualifier here is that I haven't been able to test every level of the game, as there just isn't enough time to do this. But based on the performance thus far, it shouldn't be a problem. The base PS4 performs just as well as Xbox One S then, as you'd expect. It is the same resolution after all. You get that same silky smooth 60 frames per second experience without even the slightest interruption to fluidity. And naturally, PS4 Pro offers the same perfect performance as you'd expect considering the lower than expected resolution. It's perfectly smooth. And finally, at the very end, we have Xbox One X, which delivers a perfect 60 FPS as well. So when you look at all five platforms and take into account the docked and portable play on Switch, that is six different console performance targets, and the results are nearly flawless. This is one of the smoothest multi-platform games in recent memory, with only those minor hiccups on Switch and docked mode detracting from its nearly perfect record. The development team deserves a lot of credit for nailing this aspect of the game. But that doesn't mean there isn't at least one issue to discuss. I'm talking about loading. But before I get to the issue, there is an important point to keep in mind. Once you're actually in the game, loading is perfectly fast. Jumping in and out of stages does not require much time, and it's comparable to Tropical Freeze on the Switch. However, when you first start the game up on any platform, the initial loading screen is very, very long. In fact, the game begins on the wrong foot in this sense as it's even worse with the initial loading screen being rather lengthy, followed by a transition between the tutorial section and the impossible lair with another loading screen, and then when you finally fail in this section, you get another loading screen out to the main map. So I was initially concerned that this was going to be a repeating theme, but thankfully it's not. There are loading screens between each stage, of course, but they're short, and when you finish a level, there is no additional loading screen between the stage itself and the world map. So it's one of those cases where you might initially think that there's going to be a loading problem, but in reality, there isn't. But most importantly, the tests I've run here were done on the slowest version, which would be the Switch version installed to an SD card. Every other version is in fact somewhat faster. This is the PS4 Pro version, by the way, and it's very similar on Xbox as well. And as you can see, even for this initial loading time, the loading is not really a big deal. So from a technical standpoint then, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair is a great showpiece for both the team at Playtonic itself and the Unity engine. It looks and runs like a dream on all platforms. But what about the rest of the experience? Well, I didn't mention audio yet, and this is one of the high points for the game, at least for me. There were multiple composers working on this project once again, including David Wise, Grant Kirkhope, Matt Griffin, and Dan Murdoch. But the difference here between the original game lies in its atmosphere. The original game has more of an upbeat Grant Kirkhope sound to it, while The Impossible Lair offers a more atmospheric David Wise style soundtrack, something more in line with, say, Donkey Kong Country 2 which just happens to be exactly what I was hoping for, and all four composers are firing on all cylinders for this one. The soundtrack 
is simply superb and greatly contributes to the overall experience. From the upbeat track used in city areas like this, to this take on the underwater sections, which is just pitch perfect. It all sounds wonderful, but it's the game itself that perhaps matters most, and it's here where I found myself most impressed. You see, the controls and platforming in this game are remarkable with precise movement, yet a focus on momentum. In fact, I think I prefer the feel of this game to Retro Studio's amazing Tropical Freeze. It really is that good. The level design is brilliant too, with a nice mix of slower puzzle-driven sections combined with more high-speed areas. But the most unique change here stems from the overworld itself. Here, players can freely run around a rather large map, unlocking new stages in the process, but what separates this from other similar games lies in the structure and focus on puzzles within this world. You see, you'll need to explore the map and poke at its corners to unlock new areas. Case in point, after navigating this underground tunnel, you can pop up here, grab one of these bombs, and knock open this gate. Then grab another one, hit the switch, then cross the platforms to grab a key, where you can then obtain another bomb to open up this wall's face. This then causes water to flow out into the world map, which in turn floods this level, which is a neat mechanic in itself. Most of the stages have two very different iterations. Take this stage. You run through the factory area in one variant, but later on you can flood the level and suddenly it's an underwater stage a la Donkey Kong Country, and it's super cool. If you've been watching this channel then, you know that I love platform games, but there are a lot of them out there and not all of them hit the mark. The Impossible Lair though, this is one I really wouldn't want to miss. It recalls the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy while offering its own unique take on the genre and I can't recommend it enough. As for which version to check out, well, you now have all the information. The PS4 Pro version is disappointing, but every other version is solid when you consider the platforms they are on. The Switch version is perhaps the least impressive looking overall, and there is a significant gulf between that and, say, Xbox One X, but hitting that all-important 60 frames per second while maintaining the same level of visual quality for the most part makes for a great portable adventure. It's a great game on all platforms. But that's it for the moment. If you enjoyed this video, as always, be sure to like and subscribe, ring the notification bell for instant updates, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, keep platforming alive. <laughs>